Yeah, it is a pleasure for me to welcome Simon Rotke to our finance research seminar. Simon is assistant professor at the Amsterdam Business School, and he has published in highly ranked journals such as the Review of Financial Studies and the Review of Finance. And today he presents the working paper Streaks in Daily Returns, which he's working on together with Alexander Klose and Alexandra Kuhl, both from the University of Kiel. And yeah, Simon, it's nice to have you here. And yeah, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christian, for, for the nice um, introduction. And thanks so much for the invitation. Um, also, thank you everyone for attending and for your interest uh, in our work. Um, like you said, this is joint work with uh, Alex Kloos and Alex Kuhl from Kiel. And um, uh, let me start uh, with a little bit of a motivation. So we know from the um, behavioral economics and psychology literature that people have a tendency to extrapolate uh, all kinds of things from the past into the future. And um, it looks like this is also true for returns. Uh, in recent years, there's been lots of research on this. Uh, for example, uh, Greenwood and Schleifer um, showed that investors' expectations of future stock market returns are consistent with extrapolative belief formation uh, and, and very much inconsistent with rational expectations. Um, now, you may ask, you know, so what? Well, why should we care about that, right? Uh, well, it turns out that some uh, anomalous phenomena uh, could potentially be linked to extrapolation. Uh, phenomena such as um, mutual fund flows uh, that have been linked to extrapolation um, of mutual fund investors um, in the sense that they um, extrapolate recent past performance of fund managers. Um, also, a uh, very big topic, of course, bubbles, uh, which are usually um, measured at quarterly or monthly frequencies. Now, in this paper, we will also focus on mispricing, um, in particular of equity securities, but a different form. Um, at least compared to what you're used to uh, when you think about bubbles, uh, namely high frequency. And, and more precisely, it's going to be about uh, daily returns. And we will see that this mispricing uh, can actually become quite large. And it happens even for the largest and most liquid stocks um, around the world. So to summarize the idea, we use uh, a slightly adapted model from Da, Wang, and Jin, um, which uh, was recently published in the JFE. Um, and uh, we derive a very simple additional implication. Um, uh, when, when a stock price goes up several times in a row, people tend to get excited, okay, and vice versa. And that is what we call a streak. And that leads to a simple empirical strategy, which is you just buy stocks that went down several times in a row, and you sell stocks that went up several times in a row. Okay, and then we value weight the stocks within our portfolios, so that, you know, thereby we focus on the largest stocks in the US and we avoid liquidity related biases. And that's it, okay? So very simple. And the results are surprisingly strong, okay? So such a trading strategy actually generates a very large Sharpe ratio um, despite its focus on the largest stocks. So it's about uh, two on an annual basis. Um, and we can replicate it in all international markets that we looked at. So. Uh, Asia, Europe, Canada, Japan. Um, and the strategies across regions are not highly correlated with e each other. So, so when you combine multiple regional strategies, you can even further increase your Sharpe ratio. Um, actually, it turns out that the Sharpe ratio you can get is about three. Um, and then we conduct several tests uh, to make sure we're not picking up uh, simple liquidity effects. So, um, you know, this would probably be the most obvious alternative hypothesis, um, but we have a battery of tests um, that are very much inconsistent with the liquidity explanation. Um, we also show that this phenomenon is distinct from short-term reversal, right? So that would be another pretty obvious concern, right? That this is just another way of generating uh, the well-known short-term reversal effect. But we again have uh, some tests um, that distinguish our streak effect from that. Uh, and also from other um, known forms of return predictability that could make any sense in, in this context. And then uh, we run several more specific tests related to the model um, regarding earnings announcements. Um, so our results are stronger on days when a firm announces their earnings, uh, consistent with the idea that 
the information released on that day decreases disagreement. Um, sentiment is another direct implication from the model. Um, so when general sentiment in the economy is high, our results, especially for the short leg, um, become stronger. And last, we also measure the degree of extrapolation. Um, so this comes directly from the model. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. And again, we find that for stocks where extrapolation has been particularly high in the past, uh, we find stronger return predictability. And probably most striking from a practitioner's perspective is that uh, a simple long only strategy um, seems to survive trading costs, uh, at least the trading costs that we can measure, which are bid ask spreads. So that's what we have data on. Um, but to the extent that these approximate the real world um, trading costs sufficiently well, um, it looks like one might actually be able to make money uh, trading on the strategy. Um, so let's uh, start with the model. And what we're doing is we're basically modifying, or uh, I could also say simplifying, the model of Da Wang and, and Jim. So I'm just going to go over the intuition of the model really quickly. Um, there's two types of agents, okay? So we have arbitrageurs and extrapolators, okay? And arbitrageurs um, know the fundamental value. So they're the smart guys, if you want, okay? Um, but they do have limited risk-bearing capacity, uh, which means that they are risk-averse and they have limited capital. So they can't just uh, simply trade away all the mispricing uh, within a second, okay? And then we have our extrapolators um, and their demand depends on sentiment, okay? And the sentiment depends on past returns. So this is the extrapolation part. So when you see high positive price changes, um, your demand becomes higher. And when you see strong negative price changes, uh, your urge to sell becomes stronger. Now, the bottom line is when sentiment is high, uh, prices will overshoot and we will see overpricing and overpricing tends to reverse, right? So we'll see low returns going forward. Uh, and vice versa for low sentiment. So um, we will see underpricing, uh, which will also reverse. So for low sentiment stocks, we have positive return predictability. Um, so let's look at that um, with a highly stylized example to understand um, this idea a little bit more intuitively. So let's start with no disagreement here in T equals zero. Um, and then we have a string of uh, good news. Okay, so the rational price uh, which is exactly equal to the belief of the arbitrageur, which we labeled um, R here, okay, um, uh, goes up several times in a row, right? So we have here, 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 the price uh, goes up. Now, the extrapolators, they form their belief based on past price changes, okay? And as usual in a model, uh, we make things simple. So here, past price changes are the only thing that they care about, which means they get excited when they see positive price changes. And uh, their beliefs are plotted as the green triangles here. Um, so after a series of good news, they believe that there's more to come, right? So that this is going to continue like this. Uh, so this is basically their extrapolation, right? And in the fourth period, they get so excited that they believe the true value of the stock uh, in this example is $10.60. Uh, while well, really it's only uh, about $10.15, um, as we can see from the belief of the arbitrageur. So since the arbitrageur is risk averse and doesn't have unlimited capital, she can't uh, just put on a huge short sale to eliminate this mispricing. So the price is going to be some weighted average um, of those beliefs of the arbitrageurs and the extrapolators, okay? So in this example, it's $10.40. And then in period five, we all of a sudden see a negative signal. So fundamentally, the stock is now uh, only worth uh, $10.10. And the extrapolators, as we model them in this extreme way that they only care about past price changes, now completely lose interest in the stock. Okay, so they don't have any more demand. Uh, or more intuitively, they now realize that they were wrong and the string of good news does not continue forever after. So they sell the stock. And now the price coincides uh, with the belief of the arbitrageur, which is again, uh, $10.10. So that means we see a huge negative return, right? From 10, um, uh, 60, uh, sorry, from 10.40 to $10.10. So that's about minus 3%. And for a daily return, that's actually quite a lot. So 
this same intuition actually works for strings of negative news, right? So you basically have a mirror image of, of this. Uh, you just flip this um, along the X axis. So let me briefly walk you through the model's main equations that are behind this intuition. So first of all, uh, the extrapolator's expectations are formed based on sentiment, okay? And nothing else. So sentiment, uh, like I said earlier, um, is based on past price changes. So it's just a, a weighted average of past um, price changes. And we weight them exponentially decaying with this uh, parameter lambda two to the power of k here, okay? So that means that more recent price changes are more important than those in the distant past. And these uh, lambda parameters, lambda two and uh, lambda one in particular, um, govern the degree of extrapolation. So uh, for our purposes, we're gonna make some simplifying assumptions and uh, subsume all lambdas into one parameter, which we call, or lambda one, lambda two into one parameter, which we then call uh, lambda, okay? Uh, so that will govern the degree of extrapolation, which means high lambda uh, means a lot of extrapolation, low lambda means uh, less extrapolation. All right, now in equilibrium, uh, we now get this uh, very uh, nice looking formula for the price change. Um, and well, it's actually more intuitive than it looks at first glance. So there are three components to the price change, this one, this one, and this one. Um, so this is the price change of tomorrow, right? From T to T plus one. And the first thing is uh, the most recent fundamental news, right? This is the epsilon T plus one. Um, so that goes into the price change. It's kind of obvious, right? And the other thing is the market risk premium. So the compensation for, um, for holding the risky asset, right? So this is this part right here. So that depends on risk aversion, right? This is the gamma parameter. Um, the risk, so measured as the volatility of the asset, sigma squared, the variance of the asset, and Q is just the supply of shares. Uh, the second thing is um, a term that depends on sentiment, right? So this is uh, the one right here. And that comes from the demand of the extrapolators. So if this part here is large, um, we will see uh, um, a negative price change, right? Because we have a negative sign right here. Okay, and finally, there's a component um, that depends on the starting sentiment as zero, but that one is not, not really key. So in essence, the first component is the price change that we would get under rational expectations, right? So the return would observe if there were no wacky extrapolators in the economy. And the second component reflects our extrapolators um, in the sense that a series of positive past price changes leads to a more negative return in period T plus one, and a series of negative past price changes leads to a more positive return in period T plus one. All right, and the three components are simply weighted depending on their uh, degree of extrapolation, right? So this is the, the lambdas, they, they show up here, uh, and the fraction of the population that are extrapolators and uh, arbitrageur, right? So mu e is a fraction of extrapolators, mu f a uh, fraction of fundamental traders or ext extrapolators. Okay, and they add up to one actually. So the model has uh, a very simple implication, which is when we have high sentiment, right? A series of good news that got our extrapolators excited, we expect low return going forward. And when sentiment is low, meaning we had a series of bad news, we expect high return going forward. So what is nice about this model is that it helps us make empirical predictions that are easily testable. Um, and uh, the, the reason I say that is sentiment itself cannot be observed, right? So we don't know how excited or pessimistic investors are. Um, but we do know that it is a function of past price changes in this model of pure extrapolation, right? Nothing else matters actually. So a streak is actually a very nice non-parametric and, uh, and thereby also robust way of proxying for the sentiment effect. And again, positive streaks uh, imply high sentiment, people get excited, we see overpricing, negative streaks uh, imply low sentiment, people are overly pessimistic and we have underpricing. All right, so now let's go ahead and take this very simple prediction to the data. Um, and the data that we, uh, that we 
views here are fairly standard. So for prices, volumes, bid ask spreads, uh, we have CRISP. Um, we start in 1998, uh, following Stefan Nagel, actually, uh, in his 2012 paper, uh, he talks a little bit more uh, in, in more detail on how the market stru structure was very different before 1998. So for daily analysis, uh, he, he recommends starting in, in 1998. We have some tests that rely on earnings announcement dates. Uh, those come from CompuStat, also very standard. For international data, we use DataStream. Um, we actually were able to get the same um, sample period there. Um, Risk-free rates, um, factor returns um, are all from Ken French's uh, data library. And um, uh, for one particular test, uh, we use a sentiment indicator. Um, so for market-wide sentiment, um, that's from Dashan Wang's website, um, who has a, a longer time series um, and also an, an improved version of the well-known uh, baker Vergler uh, sentiment index. So they, they have a very nice paper on this. Okay, so armed with those data, uh, here's the empirical exercise. Um, so if a stock goes down um, one, two, three, four, or five days in a row, we put it on one of these five losing streak um, portfolios, right? So by the way, I, I should say going down um, is measured relative to the market return. So if your return is lower than that of the market, we call you a loser. Uh, if a stock goes up relative to the market, um, one, two, three, four, five days in a row, so that's uh, down here, um, then um, it ends up in one of those winning streak portfolios. And within the portfolio, stocks are evaluated by their market capitalization within the portfolios, right? So the largest weight is on the largest stocks. And what I show you here in this table are uh, daily returns in excess of the market. Okay, so for example, um, stocks that lost yesterday relative to the market have an average of 0.8 basis points per day higher uh, returns than, than the market. Okay, stocks that lost two days in a row have um, four basis points higher return than the market. Um, and if you go all the way to the right, we have five days in a row, you get about 11 basis points um, um, higher return than the market. So you can see that all of these are highly statistically significant. We have the um, T statistics here in parentheses and um, all of these portfolios are really large. So even um, the last one right here has about 135 uh, stocks in it, okay? Uh, on average, right? So consistent with the model, um, the returns also get more extreme the longer the streak, right? Because in the model, if a losing streak is longer, sentiment is more negative. Um, and, and the same, of course, for winning streaks. Um, so you actually see that here, right? So returns for losing streaks monotonically increase, right? So these numbers get um, larger the further you go to the right. And for winning streaks, they monotonically decrease, right? So we get smaller or more negative numbers the further we go to the right. So um, in essence, the top row is what you need to buy, right? If you wanna form a trading strategy and um, the bottom row is what you need to short sell, okay? Um, so um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna buy um, the two, three, four and five day uh, losing streak portfolios. We're gonna leave out the, the one day streak, right? Because um, that's just short-term reversal, right? We don't wanna um, show the same thing that has already been shown. And you sell each of the um, positive streak portfolios. So the two day, three day, four day, five day. Again, we leave out the one day streak. Um, you know, another reason why you, why you don't want that in there is uh, you don't really, you can't really call a one day uh, return a streak, right? Okay, and then you put uh, a fourth of, your, of the weight of your portfolio on each of these um, portfolios. Okay, so uh, you equal weight across the portfolios, but within the portfolios, you still value weight. Now, um, when, you, uh, when you trade this long short strategy, it delivers an excess return of 13 basis points uh, per day. And the annualized Sharpe ratio is about 1.9. Now you can do some other stuff to hedge out market exposure and increase the Sharpe ratio to uh, above two, as you can see here in the last three columns. 
Um, the first one is, is very simple. So instead of comparing a stock's excess return to that of the market excess return to determine whether you're a winner or a loser, um, you compare it to beta times the market excess return, right? So you account for the fact that some stocks have higher and some have lower exposure to the market. And that already reduces market exposure um, of the strategy from uh, what we have here is 0 0.218 to 0 0.1. Four, three. Okay, and you can see that it also affects the Sharpe ratio very favorably. So we get a Sharpe ratio of 2.136. Okay. Now, the second technique is um, borrowed from a paper by uh, Ken Daniel and Sheridan uh, Titman. And what you do is on the evening of the day when you calculate your portfolio composition, okay, you take the portfolio that you plan to trade uh, tomorrow morning. And you calculate the hypothetical returns of that portfolio for the previous 252 days um, uh, of returns. So of, of the history of returns that, that you already have. Okay. And um, now you take those hypothetical returns of that portfolio you're going to trade tomorrow and calculate how that portfolio over the, those last 252 days would have co-varied with the market. So that gives you a much better forecast of the beta of that portfolio. And indeed, as you can see, um, you reduce your beta even more here. So it goes down to uh, 0 0.098. Uh, you also get a slightly higher uh, Sharpe ratio. And the last one is basically doing uh, both techniques at once. Um, so you get a, a beta estimate that is, uh, the point estimate is actually a little bit higher, but the overall Sharpe, Sharpe ratio is actually the highest um, in this table, okay? Now, uh, another quite important thing that we tested uh, can be found in the second column here. So if you're worried about whether closing prices can actually be obtained by an investor in real life and uh, whether they are too prone to pick up bid ask bounce, um, we actually did everything um, with mid prices as well. Okay, so the mid price is the average of the last bid and ask price of the day. So um, we use that instead of closing prices. And as you can see, it actually still works. So you earn a highly significant, almost 11 basis points uh, per day. And your Sharpe ratio is also still 1.56. So um, that's also still quite significant. Now, um, we also have uh, some out of sample evidence. And um, it looks like the strategy actually works just as well in, uh, in the regions that we looked at. And we follow pharma and French here. So we look at uh, Asia Pacific, um, Canada. So pharma and French actually um, um, look at North America, which is Canada and, and the US together. But since we've already looked at the US, uh, we single out Canada here. We look at Europe and we look at Japan. And you can see, we basically get exactly the same patterns. So we have monotonically increasing returns for losing streaks right um, here, here in Europe as well, and in Japan. And um, uh, the T statistics are all very large, right? You get, we have statistics of eight uh, here, even in, in, in Asia. And for winning streaks, we get monotonically decreasing returns for each of these, okay? Um, so, and, and almost all of these are statistically significant. Um, so it looks like we can um, very well replicate the results uh, internationally. Uh, in fact, um, when you form um, your long short portfolios as we did in the US, um, you again get a really high Sharpe ratio in each of these regions, uh, actually of a very similar magnitude, right? So we have 2.1 here in Asia, Canada is a little bit lower, Europe uh, above two and Japan um, 1.85. So uh, another thing that's quite remarkable is um, I also show you the correlation matrix here, right? So when you look at those correlations, um, you see that all these numbers are actually pretty small, right? So uh, it looks like they, they are not very uh, strongly correlated with each other. And uh, that tells us of course, that when you combine them um, and how we're gonna do it here is we're just gonna use an equally weighted combination of, the, of these five regions. Um, you know, uh, standard finance uh, theory tells us that we should get an even higher Sharpe ratio. And that's 
in fact, uh, what we find. So when you combine them, put one fifth of your money on each of these regional street portfolios, you would get a sharp ratio um, that is almost too high uh, to say it. So uh, again, uh, this is um, just an equally weighted combination of these five regional street portfolios. But of course, within the portfolios, stocks are still weighted according to their market capitalization. Okay. Uh, just to make sure that the that our results are not driven by by tiny stocks, which internationally is probably even more important, uh, and to avoid liquidity uh, related biases. Speaking of liquidity, um, the first thing that may come to your mind here when you see this is probably this must have something to do with liquidity, right? Um, however, recall that the um, that we evaluate, right? So I've stressed that. Um, the returns are mainly driven by really large stocks. And uh, to dig a little bit deeper, what we did here in this exercise is um, we split the universe of stocks into three groups uh, on each day uh, into those with the highest quoted bid ask spreads. Okay. Um, so um, this is our proxy for liquidity, right? Uh, so here on the right, we have the really illiquid stocks. Um, we have the medium bid ask spreads here in the, in the middle and the low bid ask spreads, so the really liquid stocks uh, on the left. And then we just form our strategy, buying losing streaks, selling winning streaks uh, within each of these buckets. And um, then let's not only look at closing price returns, but also returns based on mid prices. Okay, so let's start with the uh, super illiquid subsample on the right. Okay, so the closing price returns here are really large, right? So um, we see something like 35 basis points per day. But once you look at mid prices, the result is completely gone. Okay, there's nothing left. So for the most illiquid stocks, this seems to be indeed just bid ask bounce. Okay. However, if you look at medium uh, or even low spread stocks, the difference between closing and mid returns um, becomes negligible, right? So if you look here, um, the returns are 13 or 11 to 13 basis points per day. And they're both highly statistically significant, uh, no matter how you calculate the returns, okay? So first of all, the effect doesn't go away for the most liquid stocks, right? It's still there and it's highly significant. And the other thing is, it's not very different for closing versus mid prices. Okay, um, so this is um, kind of uh, evidence in favor of this not being driven by liquidity. Uh, we have a bunch of other tests in the paper. So we have some Fama Macbeth regressions. We have um, some regressions on liquidity factors and all the results are consistent with liquidity uh, not being able to explain this. Um, if you want, an even simpler test on liquidity, uh, let's split the sample in small and big stocks, okay? And let's just follow Pharma and French's definition uh, and call everyone whose size is um, above the median on the New York Stock Exchange, big, okay? And those below the median on the New York Stock Exchange we'll call small, okay? So that, will, that means that we'll have a lot more small stocks, right? Because on NASDAQ, the stocks tend to be smaller uh, than on the New York Stock Exchange. So we have a lot of small stocks uh, and less uh, big stocks, just following the, the Pharma French definition. And now what you can see is that, first of all, the effect is there for both, right? So we see um, strong and significant uh, returns here for the small stocks, but also for the big stocks uh, on both sides. But for some of these, uh, especially for the longer streaks, it actually looks like the returns, uh, the effect is actually bigger for large stocks. So that is a pretty rare finding. Um, normally what you see is that anomalies are stronger for smaller stocks, right? Uh, but here it seems to be the other way around, if anything. Okay, uh, another pretty obvious question to ask is uh, whether what we find is different from short-term reversal or, or maybe other well-known uh, return anomalies. Now, the simplest way to look at that is to regress the excess returns of our strategy on other long-short portfolios or factors, if you want to call them that. 
Now, as you can see, when we regress our long short returns on the five pharma and French factors, that's what we do here in the first column, um, the alpha, so that's the uh, row called intercept, um, is 13.6 basis points per day. And the t-statistic is very large, so it's highly significant. And um, so that, you know, none of these five factors can explain the effect. Now, when you add the short-term reversal factor, that's STR um, in the second column, um, the alpha drops slightly, right, to 11.1 uh, basis points, but uh, it remains large and significant. And also the R square goes up um, quite a bit, but it's still not super large, okay? So the strategy doesn't seem to be that highly correlated with short-term reversal. And um, then we throw basically the kitchen sink of, of other factors at our portfolio. Um, but it turns out that neither it is in credit volatility, so that's IVOL, uh, a, a liquidity factor based on bid ask spreads, that's the, the second to last one here, um, nor uh, weekly momentum, which is uh, the last one here, uh, can explain the returns of our strategy. Uh, so weekly momentum does actually increase the R square substantially. So we go to uh, a little bit above 50% here. So they do seem to be related. Uh, it also reduces the alpha quite a bit, right? So we go down to about 7.6 basis points. Um, but it's still highly significant, right? So we have a T statistic of seven here. That's actually higher than um, what we found uh, on the very left. So even though weekly momentum seems to capture some of our effect, uh, there is still a substantial amount of predictability left. And um, in the paper, again, we have uh, a bunch of um, other tests. So we have double sorts, we have Fama Macbeth regressions, uh, and we can consistently show that our strategy is distinct from uh, short-term reversal and also weekly momentum. So it doesn't look like it's the same thing. And I wanted to show you one more of these tests um, here uh, to convince you of that. And that is a matching approach, okay? So uh, what we do here is for each stock um, um, in one of these streak portfolios, we find the best possible match in terms of size and previous day's uh, returns. Um, but the important difference is the matching stocks did not experience a streak, okay? So we put all of these matches into a portfolio and we call that the control portfolio. Okay, and uh, the streak portfolios are the treatment, if you want, okay? So as you can see, the difference between um, the treatment and the control stocks is always large and significant. Um, so that means that stocks that have a similar one day return as our streak stocks um, do actually not show any sign of reversal here, right? Because if you look at the control uh, group here uh, for negative streaks, they actually all have negative returns on the next day. Uh, and the same here for, for positive streaks. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any reversal for these. Um, so we can basically conclude you actually need a streak to get such a large price reversal. Okay, now um, in addition, we test a few more uh, detailed implications of the model uh, and find consistent evidence in favor of this model. So first of all, uh, when would we expect disconfirming news to occur? Well, that is news that shows the extrapolators that they are wrong, right? And um, that will lead to these mini bubbles, if you wanna call them that, collapsing. Earnings announcements are basically a, a pretty good candidate for those days, right? Because before the earnings announcements, there's typically a lot of speculation. And on the day, we learn what's really going on. So let's have a look. Um, what we did here, we split the sample into uh, days into um, that coincide with an earnings announcement. So those are marked with a triangle here. And uh, those that aren't um, are marked with a circle. Okay, on the y-axis, we have um, the um, excess return, the excess market return again in percent. And on the x-axis, we go from streaks one, two, three, four, five days, okay? And you can clearly see while regular days already provide quite remarkable returns already, um, for example, the five-day losing streak, uh, we've looked at that, right? Uh, gets you about 10 basis points per day in excess of the market. 
returns on earnings announcement days are much, much higher, right? So for example, for this five day losing streak, that's uh, more than 40 basis points per day that you get. And you can see that this pattern is very clear and very strong, right? So um, for both winning and losing streaks um, and for any streak length, you have quite a big distance between these, um, between these returns. Okay, so that's again consistent with the idea that on such days, on earnings announcement days, when news about the stock comes out, extrapolator sentiment tends to collapse. Okay, um, so the next one also comes directly from the model. Uh, if you recall, um, lambda was our parameter for the degree of extrapolation. And just to remind you, higher lambda means more extrapolation, so we would expect higher sentiment and higher mispricing. And empirically, um, we now go in and estimate lambda, okay? And we do that by using the last 252 trading days um, from, from the data. And that gives us for each stock and each day, one estimated lambda parameter, okay? And then we just sort stocks into terciles every day based on those lambda estimates. And as you can see for negative streaks, um, returns are much more positive uh, when you look at stocks where lambda was estimated to be high. Okay, and that's true for each streak length. You can see the difference is uh, actually uh, significant for each of them here. So we have the T statistics in parentheses. If you look at positive returns, you get the same pattern. So returns are much more negative for high lambda stocks. So the degree of extrapolation is high, right? Uh, you know, then also extrapolation on, on the downside. Um, sorry, on, on the upside. And um, yeah, and uh, resulting, you can see that you get more negative returns for the high lambda stocks, uh, except for five day streaks. So, uh, and that's also not significant. So we have two where it's not significant, but for all the other ones, uh, it's consistent. Now, um, final implication of the model, um, if sentiment is generally high in the economy, um, we would expect to see much more overpricing, right? So that means that the short leg should perform much better. And the way we test this is we use uh, this economy-wide sentiment index, um, uh, which I mentioned in the beginning, uh, constructed by Dashan Wang and his co-authors in a recent paper in the JFE. Um, and that's, again, that's based on the well-known baker vergler index, um, but they have a longer sa uh, sample period and they eliminate some common noise components. And then we just define high and low sentiment periods by using the pre-sample period to determine the breakpoints. So this is from 1965 to 1997, and we use a 33% and a 67% cutoff value. And then, um, any month in our sample that is above the 67% cutoff value will be called high sentiment month. And any month below the 33% cutoff will be called low sentiment, okay? So notice that this is fully out of sample, right? Because the cutoffs are not determined in the full sample, but rather in the pre-sample period. So an investor would have actually been able to, uh, to do this in real time. And what we observe is that the long leg performs about the same, right? We have 11 basis points and 12 basis points. Uh, the difference between those is not statistically significantly different, but the short leg really underperforms only after high sentiment, right? So we get uh, uh, 23 basis points here, minus 23 basis points here and basically nothing here. So that difference is highly significant. Okay, um, yeah, so this is, again, this is co consistent with the model, right? Um, because um, we see this uh, extrapolation, this positive extrapolation when there is a general sense of optimism in the market. Um, so that's, that's consistent. Now, one thing that we found quite striking um, from a practitioner's perspective, especially, is that it looks like you might actually be able to make money off the strategy um, if you take into account trading costs. Uh, but before we look at that, um, let's first have a quick look at this figure. So there are two things that dramatically changed um, the US stock market around the early 2000s. Um, the first thing is decimalization. 
So that was around 2000, 2001. Um, so when stocks uh, suddenly wouldn't be quoted in sixteenths of a dollar anymore, but in cents, okay, that dramatically increased liquidity. And the other thing was algorithmic trading. So uh, super fast computer driven trading firms uh, that also massively increased liquidity. That was also um, this, the rise of those um, coincides also with this, with this time period. Now, these two developments pushed bid ask spreads to levels that we haven't seen um, historically before. So very close to zero, actually, as you can see here. So what, you, uh, what we plot here are the uh, six month moving average uh, averages of the value weighted half spreads. Um, these are of the portfolios that we look at, so the streaks portfolios. Um, but uh, if you would look at uh, market wide spreads, you would get a very similar picture. Okay. Um, and you can see before this period, uh, so in, in the very early 2000s, we would see um, half spreads of about 70 basis points uh, here at the peak of the dot com bubble, even. Um, okay. So the other thing that you can observe here is that strategy returns. So that's uh, the red line here. Again, six month moving averages of those um, were a lot higher during this early period, too, right? So in this uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So the, the average returns were much higher, uh, but also the volatility, right? So you can clearly see that. Um, so that leads us to conclude it will be difficult for any daily trading strategy to be profitable in this early era here, okay? Uh, if you consider trading costs. So what we're going to do is we're going to split the sample in, in two at the end of 2003. And then we're going to look at the pre, um, so that the period that ends in uh, at the end of 2003 and the period that starts beginning of 2004. Okay, so this is what we find. Um, uh, so first of all, the way we're going to test this is we buy only stocks with losing streaks of four or five days. And we're going to do one um, trading cost mitigation technique, which is we're just going to look at low spread stocks. Okay, remember when we split the sample into uh, tercels based on their um, previous day's bid ask spread. Okay, so this is again, this is still tradable. You have this information in real time. Um, so you're only going to trade on low spread stocks. Um, and uh, also, we're, we're only going to look at long only portfolios because um, then we don't have to deal with short sale costs, right? So we don't have to worry about that either boring costs. Um, so when we do that, uh, we see on the left uh, in the sample from 1998 that runs until the end of 2003 um, uh, that um, this portfolio before costs, so that's the green line, would have given you massive returns, right? So uh, notice that the y-axis is log scaled. Um, um, so you would have, had you invested $1 here, uh, January 1998, you ended up with $32 um, at the end of these, uh, of these six years. Um, so you have a 32-fold return in six years. Um, the blue line gives you as a reference what the market made during that period. So you would have ended up with something like $1.30. And now when you subtract the half spread from each trade that we make, so basically uh, calculate the after-cost returns uh, of the strategy, the picture dramatically changes, right? You actually would have lost a lot of money. Um, so um, you would have ended up, so your $1 would have ended up something like 30 cents. So that shows during this era, there was no way you could earn money on this. Um, however, the conclusion changes when we look at the second part of the sample. So from 2004 to 2019, uh, when we had decimalization in place, algorithmic traders uh, providing more and more liquidity to the market, um, um, it looks like the, this, this conclusion doesn't hold anymore. So um, what we find here is, first of all, um, even before cost, the, the trading strategies returns were much lower, right? So coincidentally, we actually also end up at $32 here, but it's a much longer time period, right? We're looking at 15 years. Um, but when you subtract trading costs here, uh, when you look at the red line, um, you end up with a respectable uh, roughly $10, okay? So that's quite a lot more than what you would have uh, uh, received had you invested your money into the market, okay? Um, so that was roughly $4 over that period. And you can also test whether this is uh, significant. This difference is significant, right? Um, um, we also, we, we don't only look at the market. We actually include all five from a French factors and then calculate the alpha. And it turns out, yes, indeed, the difference is significant. 
uh, and about 2.4 basis points per day after costs, okay? Um, now, of course, this doesn't factor in commission fees, um, which I would argue are a little bit less relevant the bigger your fund is. Uh, and the other thing that we, we don't have any data on uh, are market impact costs, right? Those, those are actually very difficult to estimate. Um, but what we can say is that they are relatively unlikely to be a big problem here, right? Because in essence, the strategy is a liquidity providing strategy because you buy when everybody else is selling. Um, and also since we value way, the returns are mostly generated from the largest stocks in the US here, right? So um, there you need to move a lot of capital uh, in order to have market impact. Um, nonetheless, we can't conclusively say that this would be profitable after factoring in uh, all types of costs, but it looks promising. All right, uh, so let me wrap up. Um, I showed you a very simple strategy based on streaks, which generates pretty large abnormal returns. And uh, it works very well with the largest and most liquid stocks in the US. Uh, and it doesn't look like it can be explained by liquidity. Um, so also it doesn't look like it's the same as short-term reversal or other uh, known forms of predictability. Uh, what can explain the results is the idea that investors simply extrapolate um, and thereby create uh, these uh, quite extreme short-term mispricing or mini bubbles, if you want to call it. Okay. So that's, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, now I look forward to uh, all your questions and comments. Thanks.